Kylie Zek is a holistic health coach and natural health advocate specializing in autoimmunity and chronic illnesses after reversing two autoimmune conditions naturally in 2016. She's also a wannabe comedian, the life of any party, especially if there's dancing involved. And she also just happens to be the mother of our two beautiful kids and my wife of seven and a half years. So Kylie and I, as I've said, have been married for seven and a half years, but we've been together since we were 16 years old. So we've basically grown up together and we've seen and been through and experienced all of each other's phases, as you can imagine. In all seriousness, though, if it weren't for Kylie, I wouldn't be here doing what I'm doing today. And what we discussed today is exactly what led me to be doing what I'm doing right now. Kylie and I finally found some time to record this podcast episode that we've been wanting to do for quite some time. But as you can imagine, we use our free time together to go on dates and other things like that. But I know a lot of people have been wanting us to record this episode and a lot of people have been asking Kylie to record this episode. So we decided that it was time. So in this episode, we recount Kylie's story of healing lupus and rheumatoid arthritis naturally, the steps she took to heal, the differences in birth experiences of our two children, our story of learning about terrain-based health and what we think, quote, autoimmunity is, and our changes in general and perceptions on health between 2020 and 2024. And I expect based on everyone's feedback, we'll probably bring Kylie back on again because it was an awesome episode and we'll we'll have multiple episodes with Kylie, maybe some Q&As, maybe some stuff on parenting and just holistic lifestyle in general. So expect more from Kylie on this podcast in the near future. Also, don't forget to join us April 5th through the 8th for Confluence. Look, I know I keep plugging this event, but there there's a reason that I keep plugging this event. It is awesome. It is I said this before about Music and Sky, which is another event that I love, um, and I highly recommend you go to that as well, especially if you're in the California area. But Confluence and Music and Sky are like a farmers market and a uh, and a music festival and a conference and maybe like an evangelical church service had a baby together or merged in all of the best qualities of those things. That would be that would be what Confluence is. It's it's awesome. So check out the after movie in the show notes, but it's a, it's a one of a kind gathering on a regenerative ranch amongst health and freedom community and includes workshops, lectures, regeneratively grown food, music, dancing, camping, glamping, bonfires, a healing tent with massage therapy and flower essences and a bunch of cool stuff. And then a vendor village and just, oh, also one more thing. Th- this one's really important. I posted this on my Instagram. I think one of the, like the most attractive things from the outside is that there is a naturally magnesium rich pond to swim uh, to swim in on site, and we're I think we're gonna have some DJ sets by that pond, so it'll be like poolside DJ sets. But it's the whole thing is awesome, and anyone who's attended um, could tell you the same. If, if you go look at some of the posts that I've made about Confluence on my Instagram or on Telegram, you'll see that people who went last time are like, oh, this event is incredible. So definitely recommend checking it out if you can. You can find tickets for that at confluenceevent.com. And if you enter code ZEC10 at checkout, you get 10% off your tickets. You can also find information about that in the show notes. Okay, without further ado, enjoy this episode with my wife, my beautiful, beautiful wife, Kylie Zek. I just have so many thoughts coming up and just, it's just cool to see us here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I always well, think about us doing this in the car. Like I, we always have these conversations in the car where I'm like, oh, I wish we were recorded that. I know. And now that it's like time to do it, I'm like, hey. Hey, let's just stare at each other What's awkwardly. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the thing is there's, we've been together since we were 16. Mm-hmm. Like we've seen all of each other's phases. We've dealt with all of each other's stuff it I'll wasn't just a phase m- mostly my stuff but um <laughs> i'm that's not true well okay i'm so just grateful to be 
in this place with you. Luckily, I cried a little bit before this, so I won't cry as much. But it's um, it's rare to have what we have, considering what we've been through. And I'm honored to be your husband. I I mean, um, well, this is off too. <laughs> <laughs> How are we gonna get there? Good this? start. Um. <laughs> Yeah, so we we met when we were 16 years old, and the first thing that I ever said to you in the hallway (laughs) was, uh, I was a sophomore in high school, you were a junior, is, damn, there's that new fine girl. And it was an attempt to try to embarrass you, actually, as you know, because I already had the presupposition that you were going to be this sort of, how how do I I put this, pretentious, stuck stuck Mm. up white chick that is coming white into chick. I don't want I mean our high school is cultured that's yeah. <laughs> that's the it's truth true. um and that's what I assumed and uh so that was the first time I saw you but it's crazy because I've said recently this image that I always go back to this time that I always go back to even with all my stuff at that time 16 year old boy going through what I've gone through in my life I knew there was something about you and I remember exactly what you're wearing. And I just remember seeing you outside. And mm-hmm. that's like when I knew there was something crazy there. because we have that same pivotal moment. That's what, in, that's why I brought it up. Ingrained into our memory of that exact moment of like making eye contact. Yeah. And I know you, I know what you were wearing, the Hollister <laughs> zip up yeah. striped sweater. I don't even remember what I was wearing, but I remember what you green, were wearing. Green, green shirt and just blue jean shorts. That's mm. it. That's all I remember. Yeah. Yeah. But, but yeah, we met each other and I was like, I'm going to marry him. It was probably after you said, there's that new fine girl. And mm. I was like, yes, I'm going to marry him. Dude, then? No. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> there's no, no. way. Oh, yeah. I'm kind of making fun of it, yeah. but it no, was, I still was of. like, oh, he's cute. Yeah. And then, then I remember trying to run into you in the hallway and being like, hey, do you know where this class is? And you're like, no, sorry, I don't. Mm-hmm. And then it was either that day or the day afterwards. I think it was that day after school is when you were like, that. that's when we had that moment. We mm-hmm. were like. Oh, I like you. Mm-hmm. And I didn't even have text messaging then. So we had to be old school and you had to call me to hang out. And we went on our first date at Sticks and, and I a drove bunch of stuff. And you drove because I wasn't driving yet, even though I was 16, because I basketball was my life back then and I didn't really have time. Let, so th- there's so many threads we could pull. I mean, we've been together, we grew up together essentially, right? So the purpose of this episode, though, because so many people have been dying to just hear this story, and mm-hmm. I'm sure there are probably 10, 20 episodes that we need to do. Probably. Yeah. Is focused on you and your healing journey, mm-hmm. because that is what sent us down the path for me to be doing what I'm doing right now. And mm-hmm. I was just standing in our backyard, just like reflecting on everything where I am right now, where we are right now together with our two beautiful kids and just having such a deep love and come into such a deep partnership and respect for each other, especially with everything that we've been through. But let's, let's go with your healing story. So before I met you, you had already been diagnosed with something autoimmune related Mm -hmm. but at that time they weren't quite sure what it was so when did the diagnosis come in and when did your quote autoimmune symptoms begin well the thing about autoimmune is that it's incredibly difficult to pin down because everything looks like everything else Mm -hmm. i mean there's specific tests that you could do that I was doing like for Sjogren's you have to like put something in your eye and then you do like a tear tear test and so like there's certain blood things and tests like that but at the point that I met you there was no formal diagnosis at Mm -hmm. that point it was still like "Mm, we're not really sure something's up there's yes you're definitely positive for autoimmune Mm -hmm. and that was reflective in my blood work at the time because I I'll I'll back up because two years before I met you, that's when I got really sick. And Mm. it was mono. It was Epstein-Barr virus. Air quotes. Um, 
And then I just never got good after that. Mm. I, I never felt good after that. I never got better. I was, I was on the floor before school crying to my parents like something's not right. I was going to the nurse's office probably at least three times a week or maybe because I hated biology. I'm not really sure. <laughs> but it was at that time that. Well, and then shortly after that, I also got my wisdom teeth out and then mm -hmm. I had a. Um, dry socket infection. So there were several things during that time before a formal diagnosis that was kind of lining up to really become a chronic illness. Um, what was your diet like at the time and movement? Oh, Pop-Tarts, Little Debbie Donuts. Um, I, I was on the dance team. I was very active, actually. Mm. I, I did sports. I, I did... Um, track, soccer, volleyball. And then at this time when I got really sick, it was dance team. And then I got mono and I couldn't do dance because my spleen was enlarged and they were worried about that. And then, so then I became sedentary. And so then I wasn't moving my body. And then, um, so that was kind of like a, a personal hell because it was like, well, you can't really move because you have this, um, enlarged spleen and I really wanted to be out there with my dance mates and, and dance and perform because that was like an outlet looking back dance was always my outlet and I couldn't do it mm -hmm. but at that time we were still doing army health care so I was going to see a doctor rheumatologist at this time or not, not yet? yet okay um I mean they were working towards that mm -hmm. but they were like well let's run some blood work and this this and that we don't really know what to do with you. And, you know, army healthcare is like socialist healthcare. And then finally it was like a year later, they were like, okay, well let's go ahead and send you to children's mercy. Mm. And that's when I saw a rheumatologist for the first time, which was in Kansas city before I met you. And then, so I was going out to Kansas city a couple times a year. And that's when I would see a massage therapist, a child psychologist, a rheumatologist, um, and they were all trying to create this plan of action for me. But still, even then, they're like, well, we don't really know what this is. We just know that you're super inflamed and we wish we had a magic wand for you. Yeah. And back then, we were so focused on getting a diagnosis because then it was like, for me, it would be validating. Like, oh, yes, you are sick. Because at that point, it was like, well, you're telling me all these symptoms and there's some things, there's blood work to back it up, but we don't really know what to label you. And so for therefore, in my mind back then, I was like, well, then it must not be real. If you can't give me a label, it must not be real. And that's why I clung so hard to the label later on, which wasn't until I was 18. Because once I turned 18, the child rheumatologist no longer was able to see me. So then I was referred to KU Med. Um... We grew was, up, we grew up near Kansas city, mm -hmm. by the way, just for context. Yeah. And that particular day, um, I was actually in college at this point. So my parents had retired from the army, moved out, uh, to Colorado and I went to go and do this by myself. This was the first appointment by myself without my mom being there with me. Cause she was my advocate. She was like, we got to figure this out. There was history of autoimmune in the family. And so she was my advocate. Mm -hmm. And so this was the first appointment I had by myself. They had all my um, blood work in history of, I, I guess, documentation. I'm so far removed from that life. I don't even know what that's called yeah. anymore. Just medical history. Medical history. Yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, within that day, they were like, yeah, it's lupus. And I was like, <gasps> first off, I was by myself. I was 18 years old. I felt like on one hand it was a death sentence. And then on the other hand, it was like, okay, well, at least I know what it is now. At least I'm not just guessing and it's real and valid because part of the job of the child psychologist to talk to me, they were like, are you sure you're not really, you know, making this up? And I was like, oh, you're trying to say it was all in your head. Yeah. Which in retrospect, I, I'm like, maybe it is. Maybe it is. <laughs> <laughs> but all in our head, heart, emotions, all, all that stuff. Yeah. But, um, and I'll get to that. Yeah. But uh, so I don't know if you want me to get into a list of symptoms of what I was experiencing, but 
Well, before we get to that, how did they determine, and this might tie into the list of symptoms, how did they determine that it was lupus? Mm -hmm. Was there a certain test panel that was done? I don't even think they did anything else Mm -hmm. that day besides look at my history. Mm -hmm. And they're like, yeah, no, we're going to go ahead and go with lupus. Okay. And then here's where the plot thickens because I started going to see a doctor out in Colorado now at this point because that's where my parents were and that's where I was returning home because I was a student at Kansas State University and then I would return home to visit my parents and I was still at that point. They moved to Colorado. They moved to Colorado, yeah. Yeah. And so then I transferred to a rheumatologist up there and he goes, well, I'm thinking it's RA and some form of undifferentiated connective tissue disorder or disease. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, so these doctors are giving me two different diagnoses. K-Med, lupus, yeah. doctor in Colorado, rheumatoid arthritis. Mm-hmm. And Undifferentiated connective tissue disease. Got it. Okay. And what were your symptoms? So chronic pain, chronic fatigue. Pain uh, where? Like Everywhere. Okay. Like I would put my hands down the sides of my yeah. legs, like on my thighs, and it would be so painful to the touch. Um, and then in college, there'd be some days where I couldn't touch you and boy, I would, did I want to stop it. You gotta edit that out. Uh, no, we're not editing that out. Nope. <laughs> Uncut version. <laughs> Extended plus version. Okay. Um, but what were we talking about? You got me all. <laughs> your symptoms. Your symptoms. Yeah. yeah. So there's days where it just to the touch, like yeah, even yeah, light yeah. touches. I remember. Yeah. So would... like the cold weather, ice cold water. I could not even be near it. Um, there would be times where I couldn't even lift my arms above my head because it was just so painful in my joints. So it was my joints and my fascia that was extremely painful. Um, I would say that those two were the, the most nagging forms of symptoms that was manifesting. I couldn't sleep at night though because I was in so much pain. Mm-hmm. So I was on Ambien, which was insane to be on an ambient w- which doctor prescribed you ambient they honestly think that was my child rheumatologist so you you were already on medications before, even before you? you got the formal diagnosis yes okay and what was the ambient for to put me to sleep because i was in so much pain my goodness okay and, so, and then i was hallucinating and that's when we we're like okay maybe we should not yeah, do this yeah um, but that was just part of the regimen. Uh, it was like prednisone, tramadol. Those were like as needed, which was pretty much all the time. And so also birth control. At this point, I was already on birth control because my periods were so bad. I always forget to talk about my periods during the story because I, as a woman, have been so shut up, shut off to that part of myself of you know, just the shame around periods, like not being educated on what a healthy menstruation is supposed to be like. And so I always forget to add this in because now that I'm actually diving into hormones and um, all that stuff, which I'll get to, I just always forget that that's a part of my story that Mm -hmm. I was fainting because of my periods. I remember at school, I fainted. I have fainted a handful of times because of how painful my periods are. Um, and just how heavy and uncomfortable they were. So I was already on probably my third form of birth control at this point. Um, it was a big trial and error period for about five years until I was finally on hydroxychloroquine. Am I allowed to say that on here? Yeah. (laughs) And, Probably have to um, delete it from YouTube or like blur, bleep you out. Yeah. And, um. Citalopram, which was an antidepressant, or was it? Be, was it? Was it because of the symptoms? That it wasn't because arise? they thought I was depressed. It was because they thought it would help calm my nerves, and not like my nerves, like oh, I'm nervous. It's like my nerve pain that I was having. Yeah. So my my point is, these are multiple doctors, right, who are prescribing you these medications, these mm-hmm. pharmaceuticals, mm-hmm. and At any point, did any of the doctors that you saw mention anything about what you're eating, anything about mindfulness, anything about movement? Not one. Not one. Ever. Ever. 
Yeah, never. So when you say it was trial and error, it was simply just trial and error on of pharmaceuticals. Drugs. That's it. Yeah. Not trial and error on different approaches, just like, no. Oh, and this what's crazy is that, okay, like, try this one. I would see a commercial on TV for like Lyrica and I'm like, oh, I'm going to try this one next. Because mm. <laughs> that's all you knew too. Though. Yeah. yeah. I mean, because. Especially back then, had you looked up, as I'm sure you did, like, oh my God, what does this mean? Lupus, type it in. I'm sure you found a bunch of pharmaceutical results about people trying various drugs to help with the symptoms of lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. Honestly, I really struggle to remember a lot of that period of time of my life. And is it because the drugs or because the trauma of the situation? I'm not really sure. Yeah. Probably a combination. Okay. So how did that diagnosis become your identity in a way? Because I remember, especially throughout the time you're in college, you really identified with that label of lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. Mm -hmm. And we had multiple conversations, especially after we got engaged, where you were describing how you may not live as long as me. You may end up in a wheelchair. Which I'm sure was so dramatic. But I did, to my defense, I've known people um, who've lost relatives or loved ones, a mother to lupus, complications to lupus. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure that was like the extreme case. Yeah. But I was afraid that I wasn't going to be able to have kids because one, my menstru- menstrual cycle was already psychotic. Mm. At this point in time, I had implant on my arm, which is a constant stream of hormones, synthetic hormones in my system. Um, but I really identified with the label because to me that meant validation. Mm. Like this is real and this is what I like. It's like I can complain to you about a laundry list of symptoms I have or I could be sick and you wouldn't really believe me unless I said it's lupus. Mm -hmm. A doctor told me it's lupus. So therefore you have to identify that within me that I'm sick and feel bad for me. Not necessarily feel bad for me, but um, I, I wanted people to understand me because with chronic illness, you can't see the symptoms. You just see the person suffering and I had a lot of people who didn't really get it Mm. because everybody around me was partaking in normal college activities and I couldn't there was I was on this drug called Effexor and I knew for a fact when were you put on that sometime in college I think Mm. it was my junior year and I couldn't drink because I would have gone cray cray I don't know you're a bartender which probably made it a little hard well that was before Oh. Actually, I was a bartender. So you were so in, in total though you're on Effexor, Plaquenil. I can't even tell you. Plaquenil Ambien. is hydroxychloroquine. That's what I said. Yeah, yeah. Plaquenil, hydroxychloroquine, um, Ambien, and there's another one that you. There's mentioned. I don't. You're on a whole Lyrica. list. Of, Lyrica. Yeah, you're on a whole. That list one I of, remember being on and driving to my birthday dinner, feeling high as hell because I was like, oh my god, like. I was in constant state of, because of all the drugs I was trying, I was in a constant state of withdrawal. Mm-hmm. And at that point, the the lines got blurred of, is this my illness or is this a reaction drug. to a drug I'm taking? Well, that's, yeah. So when you were on these drugs, let's back up actually. So before you got on the drugs, you were chronically inflamed before mm-hmm. you were on them. Mm-hmm. And... At some point, you got your ESR sed rates tested, yeah. and that's you know supposedly the inflammation levels in your blood, mm-hmm. and they were off the charts, according to a doctor. They were, if I can remember, it was like 78, and 78. then the normal range for my age was like 22. Mm-hmm. So they were 78, and then on the combination of Plaquenil and Cetylopram, of course I had prednisone as needed all those things I had at 45 like 42 between 42 and 45 set rate which was for me like okay I can deem this normal my new normal yeah so it it lowered your inflammation it did right so it was oh bearable yeah it was still not like I feel great it was like okay I can adapt to this new level shit feeling right but it was just suppressing the symptoms and then that toxicity was coming out in other ways especially with the drugs creating more symptoms which led them to prescribe you more drugs well yeah and i wasn't also educated on diet or anything so i would have constant flare-ups where i would several times throughout college because i was so stressed emphasis on stress 
um, I would go to the hospital, the ER, my college roommate would take me to the ER and I would go get hooked up to morphine for the day and just hang out on morphine because I was in a, having a flare up and that was normal. Yeah. You say, you say you weren't educated on health, mindfulness, things like this and natural. No, I know you're going to, I just remembered something like I wasn't educated on that stuff at all. But this is when my intuition, like in hindsight, I was like, holy shit. I knew from a very young age, regardless of being so muted intuitively by drugs, I can remember telling people like, I know I need to change my diet. I know I need to do something about that. But, you know, I was a college kid. I loved going to the gas station just because I could to get. I mean, I love Dr. Pepper so much that I couldn't even taste it anymore. It was just a hobby at that point. <laughs> but I commend myself. Like, wow, my intuition was actually so strong at that age. I just didn't listen to it. But you had the cognitive dissonance of, this is what I was going to bring up. You, you were not knowledgeable on holistic health at no. all. Not even a little bit. Or even a step above that, just the importance of nutrition from just a, well, a, a meta lens. But the point is, you... Pro, like many people in the U.S. were conditioned to believe that these doctors knew best mm -hmm. for you. So you're presenting to them with this chronic inflammation and you're expecting that they will have the solution for you. Mm -hmm. So I don't think at that point in time you would have even had the wherewithal. Luckily, you did have that intuitive hit like something about my diet, something yeah. about my diet. but. Again, you were you were outsourcing, as many of us do, justifiably given how we're raised in Western society to these medical doctors, and several of them told you didn't say anything related to to diet. They said they or wish they had a, a magic like wand for me, mm -hmm. but yeah, of course I would look to them for that expertise because I was too exhausted to think about anything else. I was just trying to keep my head above water as a college student and finish out school without failing which sucked because it did impact my grades and then I couldn't go do xyz with ot school and all that but in hindsight how big of a role do you think your emotional state at that time and some of the things that you had dealt with when you were younger and throughout high school and college and just growing up as an army brat and your dad was a full bird colonel and there was times that you thought he was dead mm -hmm. because of where he was stationed or where he was deployed to mm -hmm. and things you would see on tv and know that he was the only one of the only colonels at that base and you would see something about a colonel having been killed in that area mm -hmm. how, how how big of a factor do you think that played into your health at that point in time oh i'm sure it was all of it there was so much well i can't even For me and who I am and who I've always been is I like to shove it down and not feel it. And I, I've also always absorbed everybody around me, not only because I know that now because of human design, but because the, I'm so highly sensitive that I'm sure one, it's a hypervigilance trauma response, but I also see it as my gift. I walk into a room and I immediately know who who's who they say they are and who they're not but i also have never energetically protected myself um and so this is something i'm learning now but in hindsight there were so many things i mean before i met you i had a toxic relationship my first relationship was so toxic our relationship was also toxic though uh, yeah but before i met you mm. it was really toxic my first or my second boyfriend was very very toxic and I don't hold that against him I mean we were kids but my dad was deployed uh I was an army brat so lived in really old housing and just um I kept everything inside everything was trapped inside and therefore my body hurt in mm -hmm. pain I think and that was a, that's a huge piece of it for mm -hmm. sure but didn't have that until I didn't have the wherewithal until recently that I was like, oh, wow. Last you know? three and a half years, really. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. We'll, we'll get to that 
<clears throat> whether it's on this episode or another episode, but I just wanted to bring that into the conversation because we've come to understand how big of a factor emotions are and undealt with trauma are with respect to the manifestation of actual physical symptoms of mm-hmm. illness. And, um, you know, you're on all these pharmaceutical drugs that are just suppressing those symptoms mm-hmm. and actually increasing the toxicity that you would have to deal with later down the line and the emotions associated with. It totally numbed me that, out. Yeah. So I was already numb to begin with because that was my nature. But then you added the pharmaceuticals. I was like numb. Yeah. And I liked that better than feeling anything. Well, you, again, you didn't have the tools to even understand that you needed to. Right. And so many people in our society, I I think especially in military communities, just cope by either going to a doctor and being prescribed benzodiazepines and SSRIs or just other, some form of psychotropic medications or drinking or, I mean, there's so many toxic things in in military culture. Mm -hmm. Um. And that's kind of just what you grew up around, so you Mm -hmm. didn't have an understanding otherwise. If you're enjoying this episode, please consider sharing it with at least one friend or family member who you think could benefit from hearing it. You help us grow and reach more people by sharing it with those around you. Also, be sure to head to the show notes to check out our membership offerings, membership marketplace, and more. We all know that big ag is poisoning our food supply and big pharma's so-called medicine is straight up poison. What most people aren't aware of though is that most supplements are also filled with artificial sweeteners, dyes, GMOs, glyphosate, and a host of other toxic ingredients, even many of the more natural supplements. My good buddy James Benefico dedicated his life to crafting the world's cleanest, most nutritious organic supplements after a pre-workout energy drink caused heart palpitations so severe that he almost landed up in the ER. Organic Muscle was born, revolutionizing sports nutrition by using exclusively non-GMO ingredients from USDA organic farms. Since then, tens of thousands of people, including myself, have leveled up their fitness and their health with Organic Muscle's award-winning natural pre-workout. There's no jitters, no heart palpitations, no itchy skin, just nourishing organic food and herb-based ingredients for clean, sustained energy, strength, endurance, and recovery. Numerous studies have shown that Tonka Ali is the most effective herb in the world for naturally boosting testosterone levels. And we know that testosterone levels are depleting all over the world because of what's put in the food supply, what we're exposed to, Organic Muscle has the world's first fully organic Tonka Ali supplement. I only support and promote things that I actually use and I can say I legitimately use Organic Muscle products. Use code FORWARD15 at checkout for 15% off at organicmuscle.com. So many of us dream of buying some land, growing our own food, and becoming self-sufficient away from a society that's gone completely mad. What if it's easier than we think to make that dream a reality? Siblings Jamie and Shelby over at Living the Off-Grid Dream have cracked the code to getting land and living a life of freedom. They'll show you where to find land for $1 down, that's right, $1 down, with low monthly payments as well as how to structure your vision for a homestead, retreat center, regenerative farm, or community. It's one thing to have food, water, and land security, but it's an entirely different thing to have the financial security to buy the land and build it out in a way that aligns with your goals and aspirations. Their program teaches you how to make enough money on your land to cover all of your costs to make that happen. Plus, they've got you covered with pre-filled out plans to give you inspiration if you're not quite sure what your best move for your land is. And if you're a member of The Way Forward, you get a free one-on-one strategy call with Jamie and Shelby as well as a free bonus gift. If you want to turn your homesteading, off-grid, or retreat center dreams into a reality, join Living the Off-Grid Dream by clicking the link in the show notes or heading to thewayforward.com forward slash off-grid. Let's fast forward now to where the story starts to get a little bit better. So we get married and best day of my life (laughs) our (laughs) wedding was pretty awesome um it was fun yeah it was a fun (laughs) it was fun fun. um so we get married in 2016 and at this point um you know my mom had started doing work with dr kelly brogan and so and you had already had the intuitive hit of diet playing a huge role a couple years prior so Mm -hmm. it sort of just clicked for you like 
let's try this approach as well. Let's try this holistic lifestyle and see what it can do for you. Yeah, but yeah, it was really you that was like, we're doing this. And I'm going to cry now, but I don't think I would have been able to, I wouldn't have been able to do it without you being there doing that with me. Well, it changed my life too. Yeah. Especially well, seeing you completely transform. Yeah. yeah. Well, and then I had to learn. Well, first off, I didn't know how to cook when we first got married anyways. Yeah. <laughs> I still remember I the know. very first I know first what you're going to bring out the made. George Foreman grill, okay? I know. <laughs> it was a dry <laughs> chicken breast, but you tried very, <laughs> very hard. Um, well, it's all, it was also kind of challenging I because think the I first traumatized m- you with that because one, you always bring it up, and two, no, I don't. I just you remember put the sauce first on meal. everything. I'm like, the, no, I just like <laughs> sauce on things. I just I, I like the it's the, what the primal Flavor? kitchen, primal kitchen like uh, chipotle mayo and yeah, then the, the white mayonnaise, Not and then I'll lie. sometimes mix it with sriracha. It's I like sauce. I like spicier sauce. things. Sorry, um, and you don't like you, your version of spicy is something that has flavor so zesty yeah if it's like zesty you're that's like oh that's because spicy I I'm have, like no that's I'm not I'm a highly sensitive person okay true. and I have more well I'm also sensory sinking and you're sensory more sensory avoidant, avoidant so that also I get overstimulated you, very easily we have two kids that yell they're awesome but um okay so <laughs> we we start this holistic lifestyle mm-hmm. and I see you sort of transform. So you started tapering off. It was three months. All of your medications. What What were you on at that time? What, Satilopram. Satilopram. And that's, well, and Plaquenil. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I got off birth control right before we got married. Because you remember I had that first period in, in Europe. Oh, yeah. And well, I almost like, died. I thought you were dying. We were in Greece. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that was my first period bef- after getting off of birth control. Mm-hmm. And people probably thought I was like hungover or something, but I was literally, I couldn't keep my eyes open because I was in so much pain. I don't know. I was blacking out for sure on the side mm-hmm. of the street. And I was pulling your, I was pulling you to go and get um, ibuprofen because I was like, I just need something. I'm dying. And then this woman comes out, no English. She brings me like a tea. Like an old lady. Yeah. Yeah. She was like behind in the back of the bakery and comes out, brings me this tea, and she's like, like starts talking Greece. That was a good, that was a good like, Greek impression. I, I don't know. But she's like pointing at the tea, pointing at me, <laughs> and she points at her midsection. Like, like she knew that I, it was my period. Like it wasn't like I'm hungover. And I drank the tea. I'm pretty sure I threw up. And then I went back to the Airbnb, was knocked out for three hours, and then I was like, okay, I'm good. Really? That so was your was first probably, introduction to holistic health right there? Honestly, it was uh, some herbal tea that she brought me. Yeah. Yeah. It was probably magic. Do you remember what it tasted like? No. Okay. I'm just trying to remember. I don't know. I just remember that you had like melting crepes and shit, and I was like, I'm going to die. And you're like, I'm trying oh, to yeah. eat your I melted like, crepes. Like, like a cho- like chocolate running down my hand <laughs> as I'm trying to help you figure this out. And I did not care. Um, okay. So I'd already gotten off birth control. And then we were also like, well, we want to have kids soon. Five months later, <laughs> we got pregnant, we got pregnant with Grayson, <laughs> yeah. uh, which was a blessing because I was going to see a doctor for endometriosis, which they wanted to put me on Lupron, which is a castration medication. And your mom was like, Kylie, just wait. And I was like, okay, well, I need to have a baby because I cannot have another period or I'm going to die. Mm-hmm. And then I got pregnant. And we already found out what my next duty station in the army would be. And it was going to deploy to Korea. And there was a lot of tension between I the wanted US your and Korea legacy. Yes. Yeah, so, well, <laughs> that's kind of what like informed our decision. Then. Well, wasn't that when Korea was like getting funky? Not yet. I mean, it was starting to, but not. Like well, because our traumatic brains were like, we're thinking worst case scenario, yeah. you're going to die and yeah. I need a child. I know, which was by so myself. absurd to think. Um, <laughs> it was absurd, but that's that's how it happened. But also because my periods were killing me and I was yeah. like, give me a child. So five months after we get married. I'm pregnant. You're pregnant. But I was only off of drugs for three months. Well, we're skipping around now though. We're skipping around. No, Let's- okay, okay. Three months comes from three all months the drugs of doing the on. diet. All, I asked all the drugs that you were on. I don't remember. I think it was... It was a Tylopram for sure, Plaquenil, as needed, prednisone, and Xanax too. Yeah, as needed, Xanax too. That's well, because that was for flying. But you would take it 
outside of flying sometimes too. But the point is you're on all these. I did? <laughs> yeah, sometimes. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I think. I'm pretty sure you did. Probably. I don't know. But. Um, I didn't know the dangers. Yeah. Well, of course. Again, so <laughs> this is our journey of, of waking up, so to yeah. speak. Right? This like began the journey of waking up. And it was seeing you transform, you feeling yourself transform. This simply, is where the three months come from because yeah. it was it took three months of doing a whole thirty diet, mm -hmm. basically whole thirty, and that's when I was like, okay, I feel really good for the first time in ever, and so tapering off all your medications at the same time we were doing that. Yeah, but to be honest, I tapered off of citalopram in a span of three days and. I do remember getting in a really bad fight over the trash can for some damn reason. We because, did? Well, because I was in withdrawal. <laughs> I, I don't like, remember that. Check it out. I don't know. It was something stupid, but. Was but, that in that small apartment in Lawton, that Oklahoma? That had mushrooms. That had mushrooms growing, growing in the in carpet. It? Yeah. 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 I'm surprised I didn't get sick at that place. Nasty. <laughs> we rented it with furniture in it. Can I tell a quick, like, no, funny story? No, I'm scared. What? When I w w just because it's funny. Like, it's sorry. It's funny. Um, remember when, so I, Kylie knows this cause she lives with me. Well, you do it too. We're just something what? random will pop in our head. So we'll start singing it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, do, I'm a mom. Remember, so that do you remember the story that I'm going to say right now? No. When I started saying, Whoa, no, Black stop. <laughs> Don't even <laughs> yeah, tell us. Me... No, it's funny. It's hilarious. Uh. So, so our neighbors right across from us in Lawton, Oklahoma in this apartment. It's funny. It's a funny story. Am I not allowed to say it on my I own podcast? I don't think you should. It's not like bad. It's just funny. It was ironic. All right. Okay. I started seeing Whoa, Black Betty, Bama Lim just out of nowhere. And I'm singing it loud as I open the door. And I'm saying Black Betty. And our neighbor across from us, who's black, is walking out of her apartment. <laughs> I make eye contact with her. And I felt so awkward. Because it almost was almost like you were like, Whoa, Black Betty. Yeah. Like, and like <laughs> saying it to her. And I, that's why I Because you guys like, both no, exited the building. Because, okay, our door faced their door. Yeah. And you guys both exited at the same time. And you kicked the door open because you had a box in your hand. And yeah. you go, Whoa, Black Betty. <laughs> and then I was like, I'm dying. <laughs> that was hilarious. Thanks Sorry. for adding that. I don't know. That was story. not part of the story. It's fine. Um, okay, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, I had like it's the, the intrusive from. like white person thought too of like, oh no, like I, I have a lot of black friends that like popped in my head and it's like wanted to show a picture of my childhood and who I grew up around. That's like immediately where my head went. Here's my brother Nino. Here's here's my brother. I have an adopted black brother. Like <laughs> Okay, anyway, so we uh I, I witness you transform, totally transform in a matter of three months. And again, tapering off all your medications, you didn't taper it right. And if anyone yeah. listens to this, we highly recommend if you are on any sort get of pharmaceuticals, yeah, get doing. someone to help you taper rather than just doing it by yourself, especially when it comes to psychotropic medications, it can be very dangerous to mm -hmm. just cut cold turkey off them. But in three months, just by adopting a very simple natural approach to health focusing on what we were eating not even really focusing on mindfulness yet but kind mm. of starting to lean a little bit in that direction like some emotional freedom technique things were starting to come into our awareness and things like this but really more so focused on diet um and and just regularly working out because that was yeah we didn't even really know about my environmental factors at this point no. as far as like lotions and candles because no, i remember we, having toxic candles still up in using that. like iris spring soap or something like that gross yeah gross disgusting and toxic candles and we were living in a just nasty shitty apartment place in, Lott, in oklahoma and i mean there, that was the a, first time yeah okay so yeah at this point i wanted to go get follow-up blood work because mm -hmm. i felt so great that i was like okay i just want to see what i feel like i mean i, I want to see what i feel like i want to have confirmation yes that what i'm doing paper. is working yeah and i got my blood work back and my sed rates were at a 22 which was the lowest that they had been in like nine years yes and your i just diagnosis remember, was around what 2007 a year before not your diagnosis but your initial going to the doctor yeah. 2006 2007 yes right and mm -hmm. that's when your inflammation levels were off the charts yep and then now fast forward nine almost ten years and they're normal for the first time ever. Within three months. Within three months. And I remember having that piece of paper and crying to you being like, I did this. Yeah. 
and I wanted to say MFers. Yeah. I won't say it. Well, but. what was so shocking, I'll speak for myself now. I'd love to hear what you have to say about it too, what's coming up for you, but was when we went to this rheumatologist just to get confirmation that your internal state, you were feeling better than you had ever felt, your inflammation was gone, you had started to really resolve your toxicity and just by eating naturally and no longer suppressing the symptoms, you were detoxifying really for the first yeah. time in nearly 10 years. So the inflammation wasn't necessary because as we've come to understand, inflammation is, has, a purpose. has a purpose. Exactly. It is there for a reason. It is, it is a warning sign that you're something in your environment or something internally, uh, more so uh, psychosomatically or, or metaphysically is, is wrong that you need to deal with. It. Or like I said, something in your environment or something that you're consuming is causing inflammation. And it, the inflammation is there simply to help resolve that issue. And so you were covering that up for nearly 10 years and yeah. you started to detoxify and you're feeling incredible. And when we went to this doctor, I expected, really don't know what I expected, but I expected some level of intellectual curiosity in that you're presenting to him as someone who is no longer on any of the medications and you are feeling better than you've ever felt. Your inflammation levels have dropped to what would be considered normal. And there was no like, oh my goodness, tell me more. It was just like, okay, looks like you don't need me. You grew out of it. Yeah, you grew out of it. Is that what he said? You grew out of it. Was this when I was pregnant with Grayson? Because I No, don't you weren't pregnant yet. I you don't remember yet. going. I don't remember where. You went to a rheumatologist in Oklahoma. Yeah. I, d I just struggle to remember because so much has transpired mm -hmm. over the past. Uh, okay, so we talk about childhood trauma and part two will honestly be about our adulthood trauma yeah. that we've been through. Yeah. Because <laughs> adult and child. We'll just talk about yeah, all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. Lots of but familial I, stuff. It's there. it's really difficult to remember because there was so much going on. And I'm sure my structure of my brain was shifting because of how much drugs I was on that yeah. I neurochemically neurochemically changed who I was. Well, okay. So I'll just say that from my vantage point, I remember being like, What the hell? Like, why doesn't he care? Yeah, like he didn't I kinda remember that. I remember our reaction. More than so the the doctor himself, but being like, okay, but he was probably just poo pooed us off, like, oh, well, whatever, on to the next. Yeah, it, it was just so mind blowing to see though, because again, you were under the care of multiple rheumatologists mm -hmm. who were ostensibly experts on the body and health, and none of them ever mentioned this very simple approach that we started to take with respect to health that was having you feeling better than you had ever felt. And it was on no medications, zero medications. I would like to know stats on how many physicians that are practicing their own medications themselves, because it made me think about how he was probably numbed out, mm -hmm. you know? So maybe he didn't care because he was like, eh, whatever, on to the next. And it makes you think of, well, you're clearly numb because this is like, People just coming in and out of here like clockwork. And we were, it was still Army Healthcare. And so, but for people who don't aren't familiar with Army Healthcare, you pull a number and you get whatever doctor is available that moment. Yeah. Um, it's like the epitome of socialist healthcare. Mm, and so, I don't know. I was just kind of making a mental note of like, well, he probably didn't care because he was probably on drugs. Not saying everybody on drugs is numb. I think there's a time and a place for emergency medicine when it is needed. Yeah, I'm talking like I'm talking like emergency situation where some dude is like freaking the f out. Yeah, I just don't want anybody to think I'm trying to shame anybody. Yeah, I just, I'm sure there's circumstances where. Anyways, yeah. Yeah. So then, now we're on this journey of holistic health, and this is where we both begin going down the rabbit hole and everything. So it started really. Yeah. What? Well, I was going to say, I brought you onto the vaccine train. Totally you did. I, I totally yeah. acknowledge that. But you piqued my interest. I remember the first thing that I did, it was just looking at the ingredients of yeah. some of the vaccines. And I was like, what? Yeah. This is what's injected I didn't even know what an bodies? insert was. Yeah. Somebody no, was like, do you want me to send you? Because this is when I, I was pregnant with Grayson, mm -hmm. our son, which by the grace of God, and this is how I know 
it was divine intervention because with how bad my periods were and endometriosis like symptoms, I shouldn't have gotten pregnant the first time like that. And it was literally the first time. It was literally the first time. <laughs> the very first time. But also everything surrounding his birth, like his data, like time I of birth. I don't want to say the way. time though, because I, I use that. As, okay. Yeah. Okay. Like for personal stuff. But, but, but yes. My the, point the, is everything surrounding his birth time, his birth weight, his birth date, everything with that was totally aligned with our life already. Mm-hmm. Like he was born on our anniversary of when we started dating. Yeah. August 25th is mm-hmm. when we started dating in 2008. Yeah. And he was born on August 25th, 2017. 2017. His birth time, I'm not going to say because it's your that has code. been my passcode for my entire life. For a his year, like time. decades before. For Yeah, for decades before. And then his birth weight was our wedding, was our date. wedding date. 611. <laughs> yeah, it was just so crazy seeing all that. His birth was really rough and I'm sure we'll yeah. get into that. That's, well, that's what I, yeah. this is a perfect segue into that. But before we get to the differences in your birth stories, um, <clears throat> let's let's talk about how we started going down this rabbit hole mm-hmm. of of vaccines, and we sort of thought that that was the only thing that was flawed with the the yeah. paradigm of of pediatrics in in birth. Well, conditioning so runs deep. Yeah, because. I still outsourced to doctors at that time Mm -hmm. about, but that's because it was no longer just about me. And they put the fear of God in me about Grayson having some sort of um, issue because, because of my history of lupus, there's a specific marker that they look for when you're pregnant called the SSA or Rho antibody. And I was positive for it. And it has a potential to cross the placenta and cause uh, congenital heart block which we don't know if any of that's true especially with what we no, know about but antibodies I was, now it's like nonsense I? but the point is at the time that's yeah. what we believed we, right. we didn't know what we know now right but but because of that i was one terrified and so i got sonogram sonograms probably every every other week but at a period of time within the pregnancy every week i was uneducated about that mm. um and I was seeing, that was with the internal fetal medicine doctor, which I thought I still needed, um, that I needed all of this extra care. And again, I was a new mom. I didn't even, it didn't even occur to me that the birth world was just as corrupt as the rest of the medical industry. And we were just learning about the corruption yeah. of the medical industry. So we had no yeah. wherewithal to know well, any of this stuff. Again, we just thought absolutely. it was vaccines. That's yep. it. We we're like, well... And we were still afraid that, okay, well, I hope he doesn't get sick, but I know I don't want to vaccinate him. Yeah. And we were so scared of yeah. having him around people when he was first yeah. born. Well, yeah. And then we went up to New York to visit West Point and that's when the first measles outbreak happened. And we were actually in the place where they didn't want anybody to go because of measles. Do you remember that? Yeah. Well, if, especially there were like no unvaccinated children allowed in and here. We're like, so we were oh, like, oh my shit. God. We, we thought we had like an energetic target on our backs. Yeah. We were so freaked out. But Back up to now your birth story. So f- with him, with with our son, when you were pregnant with him, there was sonograms like once a week for most of the pregnancy. Mm-hmm. And then you were also, quote, strep B positive towards the very yeah. end. Well, I also had hyperemesis, which yeah. is when you throw up from sun up to sundown and you don't get a break. Um, you lost like 20 pounds. Yeah. In the first and you were already like skinny. I was dying. Yeah. I thought I was dying. Um, so that was really difficult. So I took what was called diclegis to help with that. That was the only way that I could semi keep food down. Mm. Well, and the, the concern at that point was water and fluids. But anyways, towards the end of the pregnancy, <clears throat> I didn't really think of I didn't think a C-section would happen to me because it just wasn't in my realm of possibility. And I wasn't educated that birth could go wrong. Like I was so young. I thought I would go in there and I would have my baby and I'd pull him up and have him on my chest. And it was going to be that like I never. Yes. Despite of like knowing birth would be painful because of all the outside propaganda, what birth looks like in the media. I knew it was going to be painful. So I wasn't I wasn't against having an epidural or any of that because I was like, well, yeah, birth, birth is painful. That's 
what's to be expected and everything else too well it, let me walk you through what happened as if you weren't there <laughs> well, I mean, I you're, we're, well i'm asking you questions that i already know the answer to. This, this isn't uh, yeah, for me that's true. <laughs> so yes please walk so what me do you through. want to know <laughs> so please walk me through what happened well okay we had just moved into our new townhouse because the house we were living in literally smelled like shit do you remember the toxic gas leak oh yeah <laughs> So oh that was God. stressful. I was 38 weeks and my water broke early and I was positive for strep B. And so they were like, oh, you need to come in immediately because that increases your risk, your risk of infection and you need to be put on antibiotics. And I was like, oh God, okay. So I went in, I really wanted a waffle as my last, last meal before going in, but I settled with last Wendy's. Supper. It's nasty. For them to tell you that you can't eat while you're in labor is just... There's so Beyond many things me. about Okay, it, yeah. yeah, that's a whole nother thing. But so we show up and I'm not contracting or anything, um, but my water had broken. And so they're like, well, let's go ahead and hook you up to an IV, give you your antibiotics. Can we talk about your water breaking real quick too, though? Because do you remember that? I was like... Okay, so we <laughs> got into our house and I'm moving a box and you the movers have been moving were there. Shit, yeah. I know, but the movers were but there you were that really, day. You were, you were just like setting some small I, things up. You I think like, it was like a laundry basket yeah, or something, something, yeah. something light. Yeah. But um, the movers were there that day. So none of our shit was put away. And I'm walking over and... I'm wearing Nike pants, sweat, um, Nike shorts. And all of a sudden it was like a gush and you were wearing your underwear and you came in and I go, uh, Alec. And you're like, did you pee? And I'm like, no, my water broke. And you're like, oh, okay. Okay. And then you start unboxing things. And I'm like, no, pack a bag for the hospital. This is like the stereotypical meme where like, uh, the wife says, hey, we're having friends come over. We need to clean the house. And, and you go and fold socks. I go like fold socks. Or, or fix like the mow, bed that's been broken like for six months. Or mow the lawn or do some very obscure thing that yeah, has nothing. Yeah, you still nothing. do that. To <laughs> this day. Point. That's just like a But you're a like, dude. okay, uh, I got to make sure our house is set up for our baby. So I'm going to go unbox this box of books. And I'm like, no, you need to pack a bag but for I, the like, hospital. But I started freaking out doing it. Like, oh my yeah. God, I need to do this much quicker now. The house needs to be set up right now. Well, and I didn't know that when your fluids break that it just kind of leaks mm -hmm. until it's done. And so I'm standing there waiting in the shower. I'm like, I'm just waiting for this to stop. And they're like, well, it's not really going to stop. So you might as well just come in. And so you called my mom and you said it's time. And she was all the way in Colorado. So it was going to be a while. But we go into the hospital and my water had broken. They hooked me up to um, antibiotics because I was strep B positive. Didn't know I had a choice. Um, and then they hooked me up to Pitocin and I was maxed out on Pitocin for 13 hours and I was stuck out of, a, out of three. And at this point they didn't want to allow me to have an epidural because they're like, oh, we just don't want it to stall. And I'm like, I've installed at a three for 13 hours mm -hmm. for the love. And Pitocin is not the same type of contraction as a regular, um, authentic, real contraction pressure wave. For my hypno babies. We have another episode coming up soon with a doula. So I'm not going to get into all the details on the problems with Pitocin and epidurals and even non-emergency C-sections and things like this. That, that'll be covered another time. But so you're on Pitocin. You had an epidural. And they hadn't. Yeah, they didn't give me an epidural at this point. But finally. They had a, a shift in doctors happened. And my medwife came in. I called her a medwife. Yeah, your medwife. Oh, and did you really say that on purpose? Just now, yeah. A medwife oh. instead of midwife. Did you make that up or is that a no, thing? No, it's a thing. Oh, okay. It's like when they say that they're midwives, but they're more they're medwives. Just, yeah. But she came in. I do. I did love her. She was great. Um, you know, she's operating out of what? Totally. She, I mean, most doctor, overwhelmingly most doctors, nurses, scientists, right. et cetera, are good people who have just been misled. Right. And yeah. so- I finally got an epidural, which was taking over an hour and a half to get in. Do you remember that? Yeah. Like they couldn't. And you're in a right ton of pain. Oh my gosh! Well, because yeah. I had contract every single time. Yeah. And then, um, so I finally got that. Took a nap and then, or slept for so many hours, and then woke up and I was fully dilated and ready to push. Mm -hmm. And then I was in every position you could think of, 
and he was not coming down. And in retrospect, there's so many things that I wish I had known to prepare for a birth. Um, first off, I did no movement throughout the entire pregnancy until like the last couple of weeks I started walking. But one, I was really, really sick. And two, I was so in much fear about hurting my baby. I just wasn't educated on the woman woman's body. Especially because you were still considered, quote, high risk yeah. because you had just resolved, quote, autoimmune illnesses. Yep. And because we didn't know what we know now, mm -hmm. you received the diagnosis that you had the Rho antibody. Mm -hmm. So because you were pos positive for this antibody that that put the fear of God in you that, oh my God, my baby couldn't might not survive this pregnancy. Yeah. So well, I, I literally thought if I careful. moved, I would detach the placenta and something would happen. Like, well, this is just another extreme. example though of, of how having a label right mm -hmm. a diagnosis can put you a in the, effect. yeah it's a it's a cascading effect of you literally creating the conditions yourself for something to happen but you also taking steps related to that diagnosis yep. that are not in your best interest but you don't know again right. you don't know what yeah. you don't know at that time yeah and it all serves its purpose and you know grace and our son I can't talk about him without crying. But you know, he's our biggest gift and mm -hmm. lesson. Yeah. Um, so his birth was pretty rough. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And so we went into a C-section after two and a half hours of pushing. And finally went into C-section and the anesthesiologist was like, you're not going to act like this in my OR. To you. Yeah, because they had turned off my epidural mm -hmm. because they thought, oh, she can't feel pushing, so let's turn it off because he wasn't coming down. And the pediatrician there was called me a stupid woman because I knew I wanted skin-to-skin -skin contact like immediately. I, <laughs> I didn't know anything, but mm -hmm. I knew that, mm -hmm. that I wanted skin-to-skin, um, that that was important to me. And they were so worried about his heart being something wrong with him that they like wanted to whisk him away immediately. And I said, no. And they're like, stupid woman. Yeah. And I remember your dad being upset by that. There was so much shit happening that, that day. Anyways. Well, the other thing that's big on the C-section is that he was, you were also quote strep B positive. So you're on a ton of antibiotics mm -hmm. up until your, you know, the time of his birth. Yeah. Multiple rounds, I'm sure. Yeah. So you so, so not only were was his microbiome depleted that way, but mm -hmm. then he also didn't get the initial um the flora. microbial, yeah, floral input. From the vaginal mm -hmm. canal. Yeah. And we bring that up for because we're gonna talk about the second birth and then also the differences at first between don't get me wrong, like our son is brilliant, but we do see some a little bit of emotional dysregulation and sort of nervousness about him that is not seen as much in our We daughter. can get into that. Yeah. I'll finish this. Yeah. This sorry. Part. I, no, I didn't you're mean good. to speak over you. No, you're good. Um, you do that all the time. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> <I'm> just kidding. <laughs> no, I don't. I know you really don't. You're no. great. Um, it was just a joke. I, I will say I do joke with you a lot. Like, um, no, I'm trying to think of the word. What's the word? Make fun of me? I guess. Yeah. Do I? No. I mean, yes, but like... Roast you a lot. You roast me a lot. But it's so it. much fun. It is fun. But not in like... But we both laugh. We both roast each other. We do. Yeah. But if you're not roasting your spouse, you're not having fun. I know. But in a loving way. Yeah. Anyways. So Grayson's birth, everything surrounding that was really impactful for a number of reasons so the people around me surrounding me were not really on my team um it was a domino effect i'm pretty sure that's what they call it like a domino effect of you know having i mean his water broke too soon i didn't know what i was doing so i didn't prepare for him to be in a good position i wasn't sitting on my ball regularly i wasn't helping him you know but i was also only 38 weeks so i should have had more time I also didn't know anything about just in general mindfulness right. and the power of our mind, right? Yeah. But 
specifically not so related to birth because that's what we found later on Mm -hmm. when you were pregnant with our second. So we'll we'll get to that later because we still have to sort of show this trend of our our journey Mm -hmm. because it all plays into your story because then, you know, when Grayson was around two and a half, we then moved to Oklahoma again. I got stationed in Oklahoma and that's when you started to present with symptoms again, but continue with the birth stuff and then we'll get to there. I was just setting the context for people listening or watching of why we're discussing this. I mean, it was, it was just, it was really, really hard. I Mm. walked out of there and I, I'm, I'm, we're wheelchaired out of there. I don't remember, but feeling so defeated, Mm. feeling like I failed because I know I didn't want a C-section. And what's horrible is that, like, I know I had drilled into your brain, like, I don't want a C-section. I don't want a C-section. I don't want a C-section. And when it was that time to, like, go and get one, I looked to you, like, is this okay? You're like, I don't really know. Yeah. And we were babies. Yeah. We were so young. Twenty. I was 25 when he was born. Yeah, I just turned 25. You were yeah. 25. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we didn't know. And anyways... It was, it was really hard, but, and then the postpartum period was also really difficult because my anxiety was just insane. Mm. But also there was a lot of family stuff that was a happening back then. A lot of family stuff, like, which we'll cover it on another episode because that's like a lot to get into as well. But is, it relates yeah. to where this is all going to tie in with mm-hmm. respect to symptoms and all the things of how much we've come to understand emotions playing yeah. probably the biggest impact on our health, but. We'll, we'll cover that in another episode. Um, but after Grayson's birth, again, we're on this holistic health journey and overwhelmingly you are feeling better than you had yeah. ever felt before. And you still yeah. do, by the way. Like I remember there was days you wouldn't get out of bed and, and things like this. It was, it was crazy when uh, you were, quote, um, you, you had lupus and rheumatoid arthritis right. and, and air quotes. But um, so then fast forward to 2019. I'm going to my next duty station in the army. And at this point we had done all of our research on the pharmaceutical industry. We had done all of our research on the U S government for the most part. And I was in the army. Yeah. Yes. And no, I mean, we didn't know how deep it was. Yeah. But I I meant because this is right before like nine 11 though, we knew was bullshit that narrative. And I would say, like, neither of us have ever voted. Don't. don't yeah, not, yeah ni- neither of us have ever voted. Uh, there's a little inside joke there. Yeah. But, um, yeah, neither of us have ever voted. and I really haven't. Yeah. I know. But we were still on this journey of, of awakening. So 2019 comes, and Kylie had been symptom-free from her autoimmune symptoms for now three years, three years, three and a, three and a half years, roughly. 2019. Yeah. Three, three and a half years, roughly. And but my intuition started to get really refined, especially mm-hmm. after having Grayson, because you know, mother's intuition, it totally. just really ignited. And right. And you started waking up to the problems with the, the birth world at that point too. Oh, there, yeah. There's so many different rabbit holes we were going down. Mm-hmm. And then COVID happened. But right before COVID happened, when we moved in that house on post, I got extremely ill yeah. and it, So all my symptoms came back raging, Mm. but even more so with like neurological symptoms where I was having like a miniature stroke and we had my friend Meg come over and she was like doing an, (laughs) a stroke analysis on me to make sure. I legitimately thought you had a stroke. I'm not kidding. It was pretty bad. I was sitting on the couch with Grayson, I think, and you came out. I came out out of the, it was like the house was so small, but it was a duplex. Built in the 1910s. Or 1920s. Was, yeah, actually 1930s, sorry. Okay, 1910, but 1930. Still, yeah. old as shit. And um, I knew something was wrong with the house, but they Metaphysically had, and physically, by the way. This is true, yeah. And I had saged that house several times. <laughs> but, so, there was mold. There was visible mold in the house, and I was raising the alarms, and every time the, the housing company would come over, they're like, oh, just allergies you're good but i was so debilitated with fatigue that i had a chair in front of the stove cooking my dinner with like sitting at the stove because i was like i can't stand i can't do anything and kimberly my sister says she was living in belgium at the time and so when we would be able to talk she's like 
I remember you couldn't even form sentences. You'd be too exhausted to talk. It wasn't right. I wasn't right. This, and I knew something was going on. And I was like, okay, there's mold in this house, but I know there's more mold than we can see. And at the same time that I'm being, I, I'm essentially unraveling COVID hits. And then we were in fear because I was already susceptible. Like yeah. We're looking at each other like, oh shit, I can die yeah. because I'm already so sick. And we, we were in the process of moving out of the house. Looking, we were house shopping and we thought, okay, we're not even going to be able to get a new house because COVID and nobody's going to want to move us. We're not even going to be able to get movers. Did we move ourselves? Yeah, we did. We did. Because we had to es essentially figure out our whole furniture and how to take care of all that because of the mold, mm -hmm. which we didn't have confirmation of the black mold until we had moved out and they took about our HVAC and it was all saturated. Yeah. And that's when it kind of hit us right as we we're just beginning to understand terrain because yep. we, again, we move into this house, the, fir the first house where your symptoms started coming back just before COVID. We were like, what the hell is going on? We couldn't figure it out because we were like, we're not doing anything Nothing's different. Nothing's changed. Nothing eating has the changed. the same type of food. Eating the same stuff. You're moving your body. Your symptoms started to come back though. And then Grayson started to get sick a little bit too. Yeah. Much. Like That's He had when... never been sick. So we were already operating at this point, two and a half years later after he was born, uh, from the position that if you get sick with a quote virus, it's not going to affect you as bad because of your terrain. So we were still operating from the, like what I would consider to be the traditional terrain theory approach of, oh, okay. As long as you take care of your internal terrain, then these, your terrain, these pathogens won't impact you as right. bad. So we are, we're already so unafraid that he would get sick. We'd let him lick stuff at playgrounds. Like mm -hmm. we were not concerned with that. And he never used to get sick. Mm -mm. And then at this point he started to get sick. And, um, so j as we're moving out, we were coming from the perspective that there was a man-made thing coming from mm -hmm. China that was going to just wreak havoc on the entire world. That's yeah. what both you and I were thinking at the yeah, time. Yeah, we were, but I did intuitively for some reason, I was like, we need detox from heavy metals. And we need to, I was freaking out about the 5G towers. I'm like, so you were, well, we, we watched them go up. We literally watched yeah. them go up throughout well, the first we few months. We were in Oklahoma and a lot of people didn't give a shit about COVID there. So yeah. luckily we didn't really have to play the game as much. Yeah. We were in fear, not going to lie. Totally. And, and there were still people there that would like, of course, scold you in public if you weren't wearing a mask. Yeah. But we, relative to other parts of the country, or the world for that matter, were not, we didn't have it as bad no. as far as like COVID No, and in measures. terms of the measures, not, not near as bad. But again, relative to the rest of Oklahoma, maybe a little bit worse because we were on a military installation yeah. at the time, right? And I was working on one. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, you had like absurd things like no running outside. Yeah. And no running. We, we didn't have, we didn't go to work for three and a half weeks. Remember we worked from home and went on zoom. That's all we did when I yeah. was, so I was at captain's career course in the army. Yeah. And it, just prior to this, I knew I was pretty sure I wanted to get out of the army because I knew what the government was about, but I was mm -hmm. still sort of operating from the perspective that, you know what, I can justify Make staying in as long as I don't have a job where I'm going Combat. to be yeah, in combat or directly related to combat. I was going to go to like acquisitions corps within the army or something mm -hmm. like that. But then this happened and we in like, 2020. I'm this like, is this is going to be about a vaccine and you're out. <laughs> we're out of here. We, here. Yeah, exactly. We knew it was going to be about mandatory vaccines. Yeah. And that's why I'd made that video in like yep. February of yes. 2020 or whatever. But we had no clue that there was not actually any physical material threat whatsoever we we're still afraid of this like man-made quote yeah well i remember <laughs> i remember watching all the videos of people falling over in china and being scared as hell and then also mm -hmm. that's when you started listening to like david ike stuff and like all these layers were being pulled off and i was like la 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 i can't <laughs> this is too much for at one time i can't well you were just coming off of being like super sick too that's the crazy yeah. thing so so all that to say we move out of that toxic house, which by the way, we've come to the position that 
the mold is not the issue in that case. It's not the mold that's the issue. It's that the mold is consuming toxic building materials. One of the toxic building materials that we had to sign a waiver for in that house, by the way, was, was lead. En- encapsulated lead paint. Yeah. So the, here's this old, rickety old ass, like 1930s home that they've just like Jimmy rigged together with multiple layers of God knows well, what it because it's military. Because it was part of the historical military. society. So there's only so much they can do. Totally. But, but again, it's also army housing and they don't yeah, give I'm two shits. I'm just saying, shits. don't get me started on that whole situation. Oh my God. I'm very yeah. heated about it still. Yeah. I remember <laughs> I was, what, I was a first lieutenant when we were living in that. I was just about to become a captain in the army and I... I got into like a verbal argument with a garrison commander who is a full bird colonel. Like when, remember we sat down I was with them. dying. Yeah, I was literally was dying and they were talking about moving somebody in that next week. And I'm yeah. like, you don't understand. And they did not show any empathy whatsoever for our situation. No. For you and so, because, zero. because they know if we were to blow the lid off that entire situation, yeah. they would have, it would have been millions and millions and millions of dollars of a lawsuit. Yeah, totally. Especially because we started, we started getting other families that were on the installation to test their homes. Cause it was a conspiracy. Yeah. Cause it literally was a conspiracy, but, um, that's a notoriously an issue in, in army housing. And again, people think that mold is the issue and mold proliferation is just a byproduct of the toxic building materials with poor air ventilation again yeah, mold in, air. yeah mold in nature isn't causing any issues it's there to consume materials and return them back to the earth right it's there to consume dead material and turn it back to return it back to the earth it's that there was toxic building materials inside this home but yeah all that to say we move out and we do a detox for three months yeah three months no it was like a nine day detox yeah. Well, I was still doing like TRS and okay, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. You were, but we, we were, were doing a few different detox. Background places. knowledge or little tidbit. We were trying to get pregnant yeah. while we were living in that mold house, which I couldn't. don't know why, because I was dying. I'm like, I'm dying, but I want a baby. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why we were <laughs> like, either. But, you know, God was looking out for me and they were like, not yet, not yet. Mm. And so three months out of moving out, I get pregnant with Charlie. Plus, I learned a little bit more about cycle. And I knew how to track my cycle at that point. Um, but before we go into Charlie's story, because that yeah. is such a redeeming story and it's another act of you defying the the diagnosis, medical. right? The, defying the medical, I don't know what to call it. I'm Initial thinking of like complex. the episode title too, because that's like what the story is. That's what you've done your whole life. Um, but uh, this is where we started looking into terrain as we have come to know it now, because I came across both you and I were watching David Icke being interviewed on London Real, and he made reference to Dr. Andy Kaufman. So we started looking into. Is that where you heard him? Yeah. But what's crazy is though, I had Tom Cowan's book about um, autoimmunity and vaccines or something, one of his books. Vaccines, autoimmunity, and changing the nature of childhood disease. And before, damn, I'm just thinking of how intuitive we actually are because. Before we had even moved to Oklahoma, we were still in the first house when I was pregnant with Grayson. Before I had him, I was printing vaccine material off the internet. And I said, I'm doing this before they scrub it. Yeah. Wow. That was, yeah. That was in. That was in Manhattan. That was in 2017. Yes. I why said, did we, how did we know that? Why did, I don't why know. Did we I was creating a binder that? because. Because I don't know our trauma brains, or because we were intuitive, and I was like, I'm starting. Well, they to were starting this. to ramp up at that point in time, oh, yeah, right? As we we're coming to learn, yeah, shit. they were starting to ramp up their uh, demeanor, like demeaning and and mocking and shaming in mainstream anti-vax. media of anti vaxxers So I think, yeah, that's maybe that was why. why I don't I don't remember. But but I still remember printing those things off and having Tom Cowan's book, yeah, and starting to read it, yeah, and then now you're friends with them. Yeah, it's, it's so <laughs> crazy coming full circle, but. So I, I, we see David Icke being interviewed by Brian Rose on London Real. I literally made, could not listen to that though. But but this is this is a key point in the story because he made reference to Dr. Andy Kaufman. And then I also came across a video of Dr. Cowan mm-hmm. talking about following a pot of dolphins or something like that off the coast of oh, Florida yeah. and if they were to get sick. Mm-hmm. And our own lived experience was reflecting that. Again, we thought mold was the problem at the time. Yeah. But had we, we, we couldn't figure out what was wrong with you, right? And then we find the mold, right? And then we're like, oh my God, it wasn't any virus because that's what we were, we were still operating under that at that time. It was simply just the environment mm-hmm. creating the conditions for you to feel this way. We were already big on nutrition, 
but we weren't, hadn't really looked into the environment yet, right. like things in our environment and toxins that are causing illness, but our own lived experiences were reflecting the terrain based approach. Yeah. And so that's when I started really looking into the no virus It was position. like rapid, rapid awakening at that rapid, point. Where rapid, Where we're like, awakening. holy shit. And then we started seeing gain of function for what it was. And we were like, oh my goodness, this is a huge psyop intended to scare us. Well, and- well yes. I've, but then you became super passionate. And then the birth of the way forward and simultaneously. Health Freedom for Humanity. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking of the, the HFFH. I couldn't yeah, think yeah, of the words. Yeah, no one cares <laughs> about the acronym, right? But those <laughs> were birthed when you were still in the army. Mm-hmm. And... um that was stressful because it was like you were living a double life because you'd go to work and then come home and do a podcast <laughs> yeah. and be like, <laughs> okay, but I don't want to get in trouble and with like the my army. My boss knew I was into holistic health because I was like, yeah, my wife re- resolves some autoimmune diseases naturally. Um, so we're really into health and fitness, but yeah. I don't think he knew that. But to the extent, again, that's another time we can go off on way too many yes. tangents. Let's, let's put talk. a pin in that conversation yeah. because so much happened in that house that played into how I am today. Yeah. So there's so many stressful situations that played in just so many things. We lived next to, to meth stress. heads. Yeah. We lived meth next dealers. to meth dealers, literally when we moved off of the military installation. But so then we, we detox. We, de- I said that weird way. We detox. We, de- <laughs> <laughs> we detoxify. You're I cute. do it with you because we we're, you know, worried that I was exposed to all that stuff too. And it made sense that I wasn't experiencing symptoms like you and our son were because I wasn't in the house as much during the day. I was at mm-hmm. work most of the time. Um, but we start detoxifying and we had been struggling to get pregnant now for a long time. And I, th- I think it was literally a year of us trying to get year. pregnant. It was a year of us trying to get pregnant. We detoxify. You're starting to feel great again. And I get pregnant. And then we get pregnant. <laughs> and it was just like an incredible example of terrain. It was yeah. really cool. I still remember you were like trying to hide, hide it from it. me. Because it was a few <laughs> so days cute. away from Father's, Father's Day, Day. yeah. And we're like packing to go Father's home. Father's Day 2020. Yeah, Father's we're Day We're packing to go home and I'm like, you come in and I'm just like. Packing to go, packing to go back to Kansas City when you yeah, say go home. home. Yeah, home. Yeah. yeah, sorry. And um. I just have like this big smile on my face and you're like, what? And I'm like, nothing. Cause I can't even hide my smile. And I wanted to film you because it was the cutest reaction because we had been trying for so long. And then I walked to the bathroom to just to get the stick that I peed on. And then you're like, you're pregnant. And it was yeah, just the cutest, bawling. most authentic cry. Yeah. It was cute. It was super cute. And then this part of the story is really cool too. So that was our intro into terrain. That whole yeah. experience where like, oh my God, this totally makes intuitive sense. That's why you were sick. The environment, not because of some quote virus or bacteria or anything like that. So let me get into about the pregnancy or yeah. about the birth because halfway through the birth, actually it was 18 weeks when I changed providers. So I made it through 18 weeks of seeing a traditional OBGYN. Actually, she was a DO. So I thought... It'd be more natural. Yeah. Well, right. because I saw that and heard slash read on Oklahoma mom's page, like natural mom's page, that they honored VBACs, where not a lot of practitioners will do that. There's some women in the South who will drive across a border to have a VBAC. Term real quick for before we proceed, VBAC means vaginal birth after cesarean for those who are unfamiliar with what that term means, meaning after you've had a C-section. You're wanting to try for just a natural vaginal Vaginal birth. birth. So I was seeing her and um, I had a friend who had just had two of her babies or one of her babies at the time at um, a birthing center in Oklahoma or in Texas, right across the border. So technically I didn't go across the border to have my baby. But um, yeah, she was like, Kylie, I just want you to just check this place out. And I, I don't want to stop on your toes, but this place is just so magical. And at that point, I was still in such a place of fear that I'm like, well, what if I fail? What if I fail at this birth? What if I can't do it and I have to have another C-section? So then I went back to the OBGYN in Oklahoma City and I said, I need to know your stats and I need to know what it looks like for you to have a gentle C-section. And she came back with all these things and she goes, just so you know, statistically speaking, you're going to end back up in a C-section. 
Yeah, which is just really by looking disempowering. at your medical history. And I was like, mm. and in my mind, I was like, we're dead. But it, it was really cool because this was you really stepping into, we had already done all this research on the problems with the medical industry at this point, but. This is where the birth right. was really starting to. Because there was still a piece of us that was like, oh, she's saying this and that brought up cognitive dissonance in us. Like, oh my goodness. I mean, she's an OBGYN. She's the expert. She knows better. But then we're, there's such a strong pull for both of us and especially you that like, no, this is not the right way yeah. to do it. So despite her saying that, hey, statistically speaking, you're going to end up back in C-section, et cetera, I just couldn't et hear it. Couldn't I was hear. like, no, I can't hear that. Yeah. Maybe that's the fireside in me, the Sagittarius, where I was like, you're not going to tell me what to do. Yeah. <laughs> I might have a little problem with that. Um, just, just a tiny <laughs> bit. But I still, for some reason, was still seeing the um, internal fetal medicine doctor, though. I don't know why. Maybe I was still just like, checks and balances. I wanted to... Or maybe my midwife was like, you still need to get some. We were still waking up to like autoimmunity and what that even is and antibodies. Right. So we we still at this point were buying into antibody tests being real. Buying yeah. Into so I wanted all those to things. make sure that this pregnancy was going as it should, progressing okay. And so I was still getting some sonograms, but nothing in comparison. My gosh, I just remembered the fact that we thought. I was miscarrying her at 12 weeks. Yeah, we did. Yeah, Should that be. was really traumatic. Yeah. There's multiple points. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, we put a pin in that one. Table that for later. Add it to the list. But anyways, so fast forward to 38 weeks or something like that. I, I'm getting, I'm seeing the internal fetal medicine doctor for the last time. A man. Sorry. No. And I'm not like a crazy no, feminist that are like, fuck men. No. Not also was wearing a pin that said I was vaccinated. Yeah. Had a mask on. This and is I'm, by January when the vaccine had just come out because yep. it was January 2021. And you could not go in the appointment with me, which yeah. I was like, this is bullshit. Yeah. So I was already mad about that. And so I'm sitting there across from him like I am with you now. And he's like, so we recommend you be induced. And... um. Because he was under the impression that he was just like the supplemental inter internal fetal medicine doctor, but not my delivery doctor, I guess mm -hmm. you would say, or whoever was going to help assist with that. Um, he was like, we recommend that you be induced by 39 weeks um, because blah, 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 whatever, st st stat here, stat there, whatever. And then I proceeded to tell him that... I actually am going to go into birth or I'm, I'm going to allow my body to do what it needs to do. And he is like, you mean spontaneously go into birth? And I remember being in my head like, yeah, like women have been doing that for thousands of years. And he was just like looking at me like, you know that this could be extremely catastrophic for you. This was in person. And then they called as well. Remember, they I, called us. I don't remember that. You don't remember that? No. They called us too. They also called us on the phone and said, hey, this is, this is, we recommend you be induced. This is not going to be a good idea for you. This could be catastrophic. Probably. I do yeah. remember him saying face to face, this is going to be catastrophic for you. Right. And if so, because at this point we had already been 10, 15 weeks of no longer seeing the OBGYN, but because we were still yeah, a little because... bit concerned, we were still seeing this, um, quote, expert yeah. elsewhere. And that's this man. Yeah. Right? Meanwhile, at the birthing center yes, on the other side I had a of midwife yeah. um, that was tracking everything when, when that I we, wanted. When we say birthing center, we're talking like it's a house. Yeah, <laughs> like, it was a house. It's a house with It two, wasn't like yeah. medicalized at all. No. And um, I mean, yes, there were certain things that were there for checks and balances just in case of emergency right. situations. But um, like I was extremely dehydrated because I shockingly didn't have enough water to drink. It's not like me at all. <laughs> but and so I had to have an IV and I was okay with that. I gave consent to that mm. because I was like, I'm dying and I don't want anything on my mouth. Yeah. Unless so it was apple juice. Before, before we get to that though, again, this guy 
at that's this OBGYN is yeah. telling you over and over again that this is going to be catastrophic. This is a horrible idea. This could be fatal for you or for your baby, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, he was putting, putting all of this shit into my mind. And yeah. I was so pissed because I didn't arm myself with a bubble of peace. Yeah. For those of you that are familiar with hypno babies, which is amazing. And I recommend hypno babies. I don't know hypno birthing. I know it's similar, but it's different. But I love it because it's extremely comprehensive, educational, like you learn everything about Pitocin, epidurals, the risks or not really any benefits. I don't know. Um, you don't feel things, but there's it's so comprehensive and it's educational piece that I love it. And it also explains what a bubble of peace is, is that you energetically surround yourself with a bubble of peace where all of this negative talk, because for some reason... Whenever a woman is pregnant, people flock to you and love to tell you their horror stories about birth or pregnancy trauma. And it's just like, why? But so I wish I would have had my bubble of peace, you know, all zipped up and figured out. I do remember being like, no, no, you're not going to say this shit to me because I was still very, very much um, convicted in my decision that it was going to be that way and that you weren't going to take it away from me not you but the guy mm -hmm. and so I was like okay well yeah I'm um I'm pretty confident and this is what I want this is what's going to happen my plan b is that there's a hospital down the street should I need it but I think I'll be okay and I left that situation being so mad like feeling degraded and just no I'm doing this and you're not going to stop me and you know, I was yeah. so pissed. And here's the difference between having a provider that believes in you and having somebody that can just negatively impact you. So he was that way. And then my midwife, a week before I actually um, went into labor with Charlie, it was 40 weeks and two days when I went into labor with her. But a week prior was that one major ice Snow storm, storm. Yeah. yeah that happened in texas and she calls me and she goes hey um i just want to let you know that we typically they, they close down the roads but just grab a whole bunch of towels and you're gonna do great basically saying i'm confident in you to have your baby at home by and yourself, I was, by no myself one. yeah yeah she was like just get a whole bunch of towels you're gonna do great and i was like uh I'm so glad that you believe in me that much. But at that time, I wasn't ready because it was going to be my first VBAC, mm -hmm. my first real vaginal birth after the C-section, that traumatic birth. Um, but that confidence she had in me was like, okay, I can do this. I'm not going to do this at home, but I'm going to do this. <laughs> but if I have to but because of the snowstorm, I will. I might. I'll just be have all to. right. Yeah. And she was like, and then you can just call 911 afterwards if you need to. And yeah. I was like, oh my God. But, it, but how she empowering was, though? How empowering? I know. It's, it's such and I had to make that point. That guy was. I had to make that point because yeah. just the tone of like, this is going to be catastrophic for you to, versus just get some towels. You got this. <laughs> and I was well, just it just like, shows the distinct difference. It's a perfect example of the distinct difference between the allopathic medical paradigm where this guy is saying, I know better than you. Here's these random statistics that we've manipulated. Mm -hmm. You're, you don't know more about your body than that I do. That birth is a medical procedure. Birth is a medical procedure. Putting the, all this fear in you as yeah. they do. Whereas the more natural approach with this birthing center, again, that is just a house. Is allowing it to progress exactly how it's supposed to. and. Yeah, I know that there's circumstances that are different from mine that are not th that don't go as beautiful as mine went. But I'm speaking from my own experience here that how beautiful that was that we got to experience that. I'm for me that was probably one of the best, most empowering moments of my entire life because I was like, I did that. Actually, Can I, I share from that. my perspective. Yeah. yeah, it was so cute. <laughs> so. Again, you had been doing hypno babies and that had been huge for you. We had already started to learn about mindfulness and trauma mm -hmm. as it relates to health and disease. So we were much more, I guess you could say, embodied with our health mm -hmm. more than just the physical side of things at this point. And, you know, there's still some, some more things there. But um, seeing you after having been told by this, quote, expert, 
that this was going to be catastrophic. You're making a potentially fatal decision. There's no way this is going to work. And even previous to that, the other OBGYN saying, statistically speaking, this is going to end up in a C-section again. Mm -hmm. For you to pull our daughter out on your own from the water in a bathtub, look at her, then turn over and look at me and just go, I did it. It was like (laughs) the cutest. And it's cool that you just mentioned on a little bit ago on this episode that um, when we went to your rheumatologist the first time after you had started feeling better and I did this. Yeah, you said yeah. I did this. And it was just such another cool example of you just completely defeating the quote odds and doing trusting your body and trusting yourself to do exactly what it was designed to do. And it was so empowering for me to witness. So I know and you've shared obviously how empowering it was for you too. Yeah. Thank you for making that connection because I forget that, you know, I just kind of persevered through all of that. And um, it's just really empowering when you can remember that you do have the power within yourself to do those things. Um, and support is everything. Mm. So I couldn't have done it without you. And Lenora. And Lenora, and my Lenora. very godmother midwife. So let, let's highlight real quick all the support that you had, but also all the things that we did to get you to both those points. Again, so going back to the very beginning at this journey, tapered off all of your medications mm-hmm. and just started adopting a natural approach to health, which a very strict Whole30 diet at that time. And mm-hmm. um, I think diet is all unique to the individual. And I, again, think it's more emotional than anything, but for the sake of this episode, we're not going to cover all the emotional pieces in this one. We'll do that on a part two sometime. Mm -hmm. But for you, it was Whole30 and that very strict, kind of strict version of paleo helped Mm -hmm. to detoxify you and Mm -hmm. give your body the adequate nutrition that it needed. Eliminated a lot of inflammatory inducing things. Right. In order to heal, in order, in order to heal and feel good for the first time. And, and then I started doing other things to help detox as well. I just want to add that I I um, started going to the sauna, moving my body. Um, I did castor oil packs before I got pregnant on my um, midsection or pelvic region. Um, and just really learned about detoxing. And um, I, I think now more than ever, it's important to really know the right way to support your body through detoxification, making sure your pathways of elimination are open and ready and um, supporting yourself with minerals and not making sure you're not malnourished. That's a huge thing. Um, Feeding yourself the right foods, feeding yourself period, because that's something um, I've had to learn the hard way recently that um, as a trauma response, I would just stop eating, not because I was trying to control the situation, but because I couldn't feel when I was hungry or I was overcompensating with coffee, um, which is, you know, fast forward to now. I would tell you that your health journey is not necessarily going to be a point, and this is not for everyone. I'm just speaking from my experience. It's not going to be a place where you finally have arrived and it's going to be done. Just like life is always moving, you are always moving and always adapting. There's going to be things that are thrown at you. They are coming at us at every angle. And that's not just toxin wise, that's also stress wise. And if you're subscribing to any part of the narrative or exposing yourself to content content online that is negatively impacting you, you're going to be more susceptible to illness. And I bring that up because, yes, I have healed those parts of me. And I think this is a good segue into our next part two, I guess you'd say. Mm. Because over this past couple of years, I've really learned that how much I got sucked into all these narratives and fear-based things and also just healing from familial trauma has really you had a lot me, of undealt with emotions a hundred percent and so it kind of came to a head where i was like oh whoa hello okay my health is not necessarily a hundred percent but that's also not reality 
for some people because I am a highly sensitive person. And now it's really forcing me to face those things that I never had the courage to look at or I didn't even know that were there Mm. or I didn't want to know that they were there. But also integrating that with parts of things like, for example, I'm about to get my tongue tie revised. And I think that's a huge part of it. There's structural physical things that can happen that you can do to support your health. But now more than ever, paying attention to what you're consuming on the internet or what your interpersonal relationships are like, boundaries, lack of boundaries, what is happening in your interpersonal relationships is such a big piece to health. Toxic thinking patterns too. Oh my gosh, all of it. And and just again, undealt with emotions and trauma. We've essentially come to understand that that is probably the biggest aspect of mm-hmm. health. Mm-hmm. And again, we'll cover that in a part two. But overwhelmingly, all that to say, you are doing far, far better yeah. than you were when you were on pharmaceuticals under the care of multiple, quote, experts. Absolutely. And you have defied the odds or defied the statistics, so to speak, mm-hmm. twice. And God, it's so empowering me being your husband, watching you be a living, walking, breathing example of what we talk about on the way forward. and. I'm sorry to everyone that we're just now doing this. <laughs> a lot of it is that we typically have, we live right next to Kylie's sister, which is great. And we typically have them babysit so we can go on dates and do things like that. And now this is our date yeah. doing this episode. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. And just because our kids are a lot, it's been hard to just kind of buckle down and do it, which I'd love to get into on the next piece I mean, we'll, we'll do because... multiple episodes, parenting, all of it, mm-hmm. emotions, stand-up yeah. comedy together i don't know <laughs> honestly yeah because yeah. we're funny just yeah. ask us <laughs> i love you i love you too thank you for having me of course 